I steal DNA from strangers like you. Stray hairs, cigarette butts, chewed up gum, that water bottle you were thinking of leaving under your seat, your fork from lunch, anything you touch really, I can probably get some kind of trace from. But why would I want to do that? And isn't that illegal? In 2012, I was sitting in my psychiatrist's office, like so many New Yorkers, and some famous Viennese as well. <laughs> and I was staring at this generic print on the wall. And I noticed the glass covering the print was cracked. And there was a hair stuck in that crack. And I sat there for 50 minutes, just wondering about this hair whose hair it might be, what I could learn about them from that hair. I wanted to know what they looked like. I wanted to know where they were from. I wanted to know how crazy they were. And when I left, I just couldn't help noticing stuff everywhere. Cigarette butts and chewing gum on the sidewalk, stray hairs on the subway bench, saliva on the rim of a coffee cup. And the funny thing is that once you start thinking about it, you can see evidence everywhere. Bathrooms, sidewalks, bars. People are just leaving their DNA all over the place, all the time, without giving it a second thought. And it occurred to me that the very things that make us human, the messiness of this human body, hair and skin and saliva, these things become a liability as we constantly face the possibility of shedding these traces in public and leaving artifacts which anyone could come along and mine for information. When I was eight, my grandfather gave me the complete Sherlock Holmes treasury. And I still have it. That's the book. My parents and I read chapters aloud on long car trips. And it instilled me with this lifelong love of mysteries. So I'm thinking about this hair. And suddenly, all of the detective stories and forensic shows that I've seen on TV since I was a kid flash through my mind. And I imagine I'm a forensic biologist. And I collect this hair as evidence. And I extract its DNA and analyze it to learn all about this person. And once I thought of it, I just couldn't get the idea out of my head. It became this obsession. I had to know, how much could I, a total amateur in the world of biotechnology, how much could I learn about someone from some little bit of themselves that they accidentally left behind? What exactly does our DNA say about us? And so I did what any aspiring biohacker would do, and I signed up for a crash course at my local do-it-yourself biology lab, Genspace, in downtown Brooklyn. And there we learned how to extract DNA, how to amplify it, and how to analyze it to learn about our own ancestry. And then I became a member of this lab, and I started trying to apply those same methods to samples that I found on the street and in public places. Hairs cigarette butts, chewing gum mostly, occasionally a fingernail or two. And for months, I had no success at all. After carefully collecting samples from neighborhoods all over New York City, every single DNA extraction that I tried failed. And every experiment that I did took about a week from start to finish. So it was just this painfully slow process of failing. So while I was trying and failing in the biology lab, I started researching just how much I could find out about a person from nothing more than their DNA. And I found quite a bit. Identity. So we all know that you can track a person using DNA fingerprinting, that you can connect them to their DNA like we see on TV. Gender. Does this person have a Y chromosome? Relatedness, paternity, siblingship, 
Is your father really your father? Ancestry. I discovered there were three different methods for looking at ancestry, depending on what data you looked at and how you could learn different things about what this person's ancestry was. Disease risk. Most people haven't even had their own DNA analyzed. So I can potentially know more about you and your genetic disease risks than your doctor does. Traits. I discovered there were already forensic services available for police to create a DNA profile of a suspect's hair and eye color, in addition to gender and ancestry. This was already happening. And then there were more speculative areas, so places where the science was just starting to come out. Things like tendency to be overweight, skin color, freckling, details of the eyes, like pigmentation rings and crypts, hair curl, baldness, and details of facial shape. Some scientists were even trying to prove a genetic basis for how we act. Things like depression, aggression, shyness, even sexual orientation and intelligence. And Yaniv Ehrlich, a researcher at, at MIT, has even shown it's possible to make a pretty good guess about what someone's last name is from their DNA. So what does our DNA say about us? It says a lot. DNA contains not only the instructions to make each and every one of us, but deeply personal and easily misunderstood or misconstrued clues about who we are. So I wanted to show people this. I wanted them to see how incredibly personal and how utterly vulnerable this information was. I wanted people to see this and to think, that could be me, that could be my DNA. And I thought, what form to better represent this than an actual, literal portrait? We often speak about giving a face to an issue, and with good reason. We're hardwired to be fascinated with faces, to identify with and identify them. So I had this finished piece in mind. I wanted to create a portrait. But first, I needed some more reliable data. So I found some daring people who'd posted their genetic information freely on the code-sharing website, GitHub. And I started trying to make portraits of them as my first samples. So this is Orta. And this is Manu Sporny, depicted from their DNA, 3D printed, in full color, life size. And I analyzed my own DNA using a commercially available service called 23andMe. And I made a self-portrait to see how close I could get using just my genetic information. And here it is. So what do you think? Does it look like me? Meanwhile, I finally started to have some success in the lab. So I began to get real results, tangible clues about these strangers whose DNA I had been collecting. Putting the two together, I started making virtual, ske virtual sketches from the found DNA. And I started printing preliminary 3D portraits and exhibiting them as works in progress. So here they are. This is a shot from my first work in progress show at the Clock Tower Gallery in New York City. And here are some close-ups of the portraits themselves. So you can see a detail image on the right, and then the actual sample that it was derived from, and the location where I collected it. And these are all actually collected in my neighborhood in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And then came the ultimate irony for a person who never had any interest in Wall Street other than possibly occupying it. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal put me on the front page of their metro section. And suddenly the work just exploded in the media. From CNN to the BBC, I found myself talking about this project everywhere, 
before I even felt like it was finished. But it soon became clear to me that actually, the media completed the piece. The work was meant to draw the viewer into a critique of this emerging potential for biological surveillance. It was meant to provoke a kind of questioning. But I could reach way more people through magazines and newspapers, through blogs and social media, through television and radio, than I ever could have through a gallery. So for me, this work actually exists primarily as it was described by the media, as a kind of spectacle, but hopefully a thought-provoking spectacle that called attention to an area of surveillance that almost no one is talking about. DNA databases, which already exist in 54 countries and counting, pose at least as great a risk to privacy as their electronic counterparts do, if not greater. And these aren't just filled with criminals. You can end up in a database simply for being suspected of doing something wrong. And beyond crime, DNA is routinely taken from newborn infants at birth in many countries, including the US and including Austria. How long these samples are stored and what information can be analyzed from them is still up for debate. It's up to us. As are genetic privacy laws in general. So what I did, collecting abandoned DNA from strangers, occupies a very fuzzy legal zone. And the same goes for governments or corporations who might want to do the same thing. You don't need the creativity of an artist to imagine what can happen if this information gets into the wrong hands. You wouldn't leave your medical records on the subway for just anyone to read. It should be a choice who you share your information with and how, be it about your DNA, your email, or your phone calls. So Stranger Visions leaves us with this understanding that we're entering this era with the potential for mass biological surveillance. And so the question then is, what are we going to do about it? Education and agitation for policy reform are crucial. But I also think we need to start developing new tools, new technologies of counter surveillance to protect our biological privacy. We have encryption and obfuscation methods to cover our digital tracks. So why not our genetic ones? That's why I created Invisible. It's the first ever tactical kit for your protection against emerging threats to biological privacy. <laughs> Invisible is a suite of two products. The Erase Spray deletes 99.5% of DNA left behind. The Replace Spray cloaks biological material with a kind of DNA noise. Erase is best for hard surfaces, <laughs> while Replace works well for softer, sensitive ones. Used together, Erase and Replace make you 100% invisible. <laughs> and yes, it really works. Invisible is for sale now at the new museum both online and in their physical store. So you can go out and you can buy your own box of Invisible today. But I'm an artist. I'm not just here to sell you products. And that's why I'm announcing today, for the first time, that I'm making this all open source. The recipe and the instructions for how you can make your own DNA Invisible spray will be freely available on a new website that I'm developing called By Anonymous Me. And I'm hoping that this will become a hub for community research into biological surveillance. So bookmark it. I plan to launch in January. Now, of course, Invisible alone won't solve all of our biological surveillance issues. But it's a step towards awareness that DNA is not necessarily the gold standard 
we want it to be. That DNA is vulnerable, that it can be hacked, that it can be forged, that it can be planted, and that that hacking is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it might just protect us. Thank you.